Hey everyone, can I have your attention? All right, so as you know, there's a mega review session tonight. Rockefeller 301, 730 to 9. All three of us will be there. We're planning on going over KAs, acids and bases, the pH scale, ice tables, lots of stuff. So we're going to do tons and tons of practice problems. So bring your calculators and um, hope to see you there. All right, a couple of announcements, a reminder, <coughs> there is a uh, bonus opportunity for you. Friday, 5.30, Veal Gym. Uh, let's see, uh, but you, yes, there's a, there's a catch. If you want the bonus point, you have to bring a sign supporting the faculty team. You can, so any member of the faculty team. So you've got Butler and Garfield there. You've got uh, Gary Schottner from physics. So James Eller from ESS, those of you who, are who go to ESS regularly. Nancy DeUlio from biology, those of you who plan to take 215 next fall. You might want to do a little lobbying now. Oh, there's some students playing too. Oh, so. so Yes, that's the, hit. the catch is you have to bring a sign supporting the faculty team. And your name has to be on the back of the sign because I'm going to keep them. I plan to post these signs in my office, by the way, afterwards. So I'll have a permanent record that you supported the faculty team. Second thing, here's another bonus opportunity for you. Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock in Twing, there's food, pizza. Uh, Mary Dwyer who is from North Carolina State, is going to be talking about bringing women into science and engineering. Um, I have no idea. I've heard good things about this speaker, but I've never heard her speak. So this is at 4.30 on Friday afternoon. It should be done in time, so you can then sprint on over to Veal uh, to make it in time for the basketball game at 5.30, assuming the basketball game starts on time anyway. So. Um, but if you've got a, um, if you've got the, I will ask if you attend this one that you write a reflection. So I'll post this to Blackboard so that you have it. And it's in there. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to tell you? If you're not, this is not, K-N-O-T, not a bonus opportunity, but if you're not doing anything this weekend, uh, Science Olympiad is going to be here at Pace on Saturday uh, for the regional championship. Those of you who have done Science Olympiad can come and cheer on your former school. If you've never participated in Science Olympiad, you can see what some of these uh, middle and senior high school students get to do for fun. Uh, m one of the groups that I advise is uh, judging two of the events. One of them is a robocross. It's a middle school competition with uh, joystick-controlled robots. And the other one is a... Uh, is the old bridge building contest. But it's not a bridge building, you're actually building a, a lever arm that's sticking out from a wall, and then they're gonna hang a bucket off it and see how much sand it can hold. And then it gets scored as it's the mass of sand divided by the mass of uh, the lever arm. And so the, hev the more sand you hold, the better. The less weight that you use to build the lever arm, the better. Um, and they can hold up to about 35 pounds of sand, so they work pretty hard. All right, computer's not working up on me, so I might have to do this the old-fashioned way. All right, so get rid of that. That's my email. I don't think I need my email. So I'll log out of that. I am working on a Kappa assignment for you. I'll have it for you on Friday. Um, you know what? I am going to use the boards. I know, you didn't erase them. Uh-oh. Can you pull the screen up for me? I couldn't get it. Thank you. I think. There it goes. All right, today I wanted to do calculations because 
On Monday, when we got going and started talking about half equivalence point, after I left class and thought about, okay, where are we at with respect to the things we're, just, we're talking about, the half equivalence point calculation really is next Friday's talk, a week from tomorrow. It's the talk for the day after your next test. Don't forget you have a test on Thursday the 28th. So before we get to that, let's try a couple simple problems. Something nice and easy. Calculate the pH if the if, or calculate the hydrogen ion concentration if the pH is 6.42. This, if I ask you a question like this on the test, which I might, it's really intended to be a gift because if you remember the definition of pH. And if I just take all the steps to make sure that I see what all the steps are to rearrange this thing algebraically, the inverse operation of log is 10 to some power. So 10 to the minus pH will give you the hydrogen ion concentration. So to solve this problem, it's just 10 to the minus 6.42. Those of you practicing to do these without a calculator, the answer is going to be somewhere between 1 times 10 to the minus 6 and 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So, because the an it's somewhere between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 7. So, if you were to do this on a multiple choice test, I have toyed with the idea of a multiple choice final, but it won't be. It's too much work for me. I'm lazy. It's easier to grade, well, it is easier to grade except if I give you a multiple choice test, I want you to get partial credit, which means you have to have multiple grading. So it isn't quite as easy, but it doesn't matter. We're gonna, I'm not going to throw a multiple choice test at you. It's not fair. Another simple problem for you. What is the pH if the pOH is 8.28 and it's at 25 degrees C? I have to specify the temperature because Kw, which is how you do this problem, changes if you change the temperature. Many of you already know this. The pH plus the pOH is going to be equal to 14. So this is a very simple problem. If the pOH is 8.28, the pH equals 5.72, and from there you could get the hydrogen ion concentration. The only reason this works because when you take the equilibrium of water, the Kw we talked about, at 25 degrees C, this is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. What happens to K if you raise the temperature? If I raise the temperature, of water, what happens to Kw? It changes. Does it go up or down? How do you tell if it goes up or down? You've got to remember back to last semester. This reaction is exothermic. It gives off energy. So if it gives off energy, Energy is essentially a product. So if you raise the temperature, 
since heat is a product, or energy is a product, what happens to the value of K? You're adding a product. You're going to for, and, and you're all looking at me dazed and confused because I haven't taught you this yet. What's the matter with me? Le Chatelier's principle. That's why everybody's looking at out there with glassy eyes. Le Chatelier's principle is probably the second most important concept you'll get this semester. The first being limiting reaction. Take my new favorite equation. Well, I'm sorry. My new favorite chemical reaction, nitrogen plus hydrogen to give you ammonia. As we discussed, it's won the Nobel Prize three times. First time because I'm setting you up for a final exam question if you hadn't guessed yet. First time because you were able to prove that you could take atomic nitrogen or molecular nitrogen, molecular hydrogen and make ammonia. The second time was to figure out how to optimize production of ammonia, okay? Because ammonia was such an important compound. The, the way that you optimize this reaction is by using Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle says, If you've got a system at equilibrium, a system being a chemical reaction, and you perturb that equilibrium in some way, the system will do everything in its power to reestablish equilibrium because it wants to be at equilibrium. So what does that mean? If you've got a chemical reaction that is set up so that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, so you've set up an equilibrium, and I were to change it in some way. So in this reaction, say I had this one sitting at equilibrium, and I dump in more nitrogen. What's going to happen when I dump in more nitrogen? There's more stuff to react, so I'm going to make more products. I've upset the equilibrium. If I make more products, what is the system going to do? It's going to push back again the other way, to get the equilibrium reestablished. So as long as it, whenever you upset that equilibrium, it will try to get back. Your book does this by talking about a QC or a QP, and it's not a DAO, is equal to, it must be Wednesday. The Q for this reaction, and Q in this case based on concentration, is the concentration of ammonia squared divided by the concentration of nitrogen divided by the concentration of hydrogen in the third. It looks just like K. It's exactly the same uh, algebraic equation as the equilibrium constant. I think the book calls Q a reaction quotient. I'll call it a reaction quotient if they don't. You can calculate a value <coughs> of Q for any set of concentrations. If I tell you any three concentrations for these three compounds, you can calculate a value of Q. And what you may find out is that the numbers that I give you tell you that Q is equal to K. Well, if Q is equal to K, what do you know has to be true? the system has to be at equilibrium. If the value you calculate using the concentrations equals the value of the equilibrium constant, then the only conclusion you can make is that the system's at equilibrium. What if you find out that Q is greater than K? If Q is greater than K, it tells you that you have too many products. 
The numerator is greater than the denominator. So you have too many products. If I have too many products and I want to reestablish equilibrium, what has to happen? The reaction will shift back to the left side. If the value you calculate for Q is greater than the value of K, then you've got too much product. To reestablish equilibrium, it will shift back to the left-hand side. The only other possibility is that Q is less than K. And if Q is less than K, then you're going to shift the reaction from left to right. You're going to make more products. Over here in this reaction, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Heat is also a product. It's an exothermic reaction. When you raise the temperature, you're adding heat. Heat is a product. What's it going to do to the equilibrium? It's going to shift it to the left. When it shifts it to the left to restabilize, what's the new value of K going to be? It's going to be something less than 10 to the minus 14. Is the pH of a neutral solution always 7? No, it's not. What is a neutral solution? versus what is an acidic solution and what is an, a, a basic solution. An acidic solution, most of you would tell me the answer is it's something with a pH less than 7. Or a basic solution is something with a pH less than 8 or, or greater than 7. And I would tell you, great, that's a partially correct answer. An acidic solution is one where the hydrogen ion concentration is greater than the hydroxide ion concentration. A basic solution is one where the hydrogen ion concentration is less than the hydroxide ion concentration. What is a neutral solution then? When the hydrogen ion concentration equals the hydroxide ion concentration. If KW changes, and it does if you change the temperature, what happens to the pH of a neutral solution? It changes. And so you'll find out that at higher temperatures, the neutral solutions have lower pHs. So if you've always learned in the past, acidic solutions have pHs less than 7, that's only true at 25 degrees C. At any other temperature, that may not be true. So you have to, it's a little twist on what we've had before. The reason I bring that up is your second, currently what I've done is your second CAPI question changes K. It tells you at this temperature, K is equal to this. Calculate the pH of a neutral solution. Well, the neutral solution just has H plus equal to OH minus. So you can solve for it. It's not all that difficult. In this one, we would just say if these two are equal to each other, then set them both equal to x. x is equal to the square root of 1 times 10 to the minus 14, so you get 1 times 10 to the minus 7. x is my hydrogen ion concentration. Hopefully by now you can all do the, P, the negative log of 10 to the minus 7 in your head. And so the pH of this solution, of this neutral solution, would be 7. All right. Here's a, a more challenging problem for you. Um, somebody got their book handy. 
you got that table handy? Thank you, because I didn't bring the table with me. The KA of HCN is not on the list. There it is. 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. First of all, just because it's got a KA that's a very small number, will the pH be greater than, less than, or equal to 7 at 25 degrees C, irrespective of this? It's going to be less than because it's an acid. Acids will always have pHs less than 7. So the Ka for HCN is 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. When you balance the equation, always react it with water. It's the easiest thing to do. The initial concentrations come from the problem. Let's see, 0.15 molar. We don't care about water. Doesn't tell me anything about H3O plus or CN minus. We're going to assume the easiest thing we can. If some of it reacts, and it will. By the way, what's Q equal to? When I just start this reaction, what's Q going to be equal to? Let's see, Q is equal to the concentration of, H, of CN, H3O plus So what's the concentration of H3O plus initially? Zero. So Q is equal to? Zero. Q is less than Ka. So therefore, which way will this reaction have to proceed? To the right. If Q is less than K, then the reaction has to go to the right. So that tells me that that has to lose some amount of HCN and make H3O. That'll become important in a little while. So at equilibrium, So now we set this up into our equilibrium constant expression. You can, at this point, rearrange the equation and get the quadratic equation out of it and solve it using your quadratic equation solver or your calculator. You will never go wrong doing that. Or you can make the assumption that x is a small amount. And in this case, that makes sense. k is 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. You're not going to get a lot of product. It's just not going to happen. So we're going to assume x is much less than 0.15. So if we do that. Then we get, let's see, x squared over 0 0.15, x equals the square root of 0.15. If you go back and check your assumption now, Whenever you make one of these assumptions, it's a good idea to write down that you actually made the assumption. But then you, after you do it, go back and check. If this assumption is true, then 0 0.15 minus x should be equal to 0.15, right? That's what that assumption is really saying. 0.15 minus 9 times 10 to the minus 6, that's 0.15 when you do sig fig. So the assumption was fine. And so x is equal to this, which is equal to the concentration of hydrogen ion. And so now to get the pH, you just take the negative log of that number. We 
which is equal to I need one more digit to be I actually gave you I gave you two but I only have one the zero only places the decimal am I sure I'm never sure are you doubting me Ah, but does the five in the front count as a sig fig? No, it doesn't. Remember in pHs, the five comes from the power of 10. So the five is not a significant digit. Yes, if I just gave you that number, you would say there's four sig figs in that number. But because it's a pH, the five in front of the decimal is not significant. And so there's only two in that number. I realize that that's a bit of a difference from what we've all talked about, but what is, the, what is the negative log, without your calculators, what's the negative log of 8.57 times 10 to the minus 5? 4.067. And so the, that digit in front of the decimal has nothing to do with the 8.57. It only comes from the 10 to the minus whatever that number is. So that's why it's not a significant digit, okay? Now, you know I don't get too hung up on it anyway. I know it looks bad, doesn't it? But it's right. <laughs> All right, how would I make this problem a little bit tougher? Somebody came to me and said, what's the hardest question you could ask us? Try this question. Yes. The question that just got asked is, does the equation over here, pH plus pOH equal 14, work because it's completely dissociated? No. It only works at, P at temperature equal 25 degrees C. Doesn't matter if it's a weak acid or base, any of that. And the reason for that is there's a question in your book. I'm going to give you some other problems from your book to look at that are too hard to do as kappa. But one of the questions in your book says, we're going to talk about acid strength on Friday. What is the strongest acid that can exist in water solution? I mean, you know several strong acids already, HCl, HNO3, et cetera, et cetera. The strongest acid that can exist in, in water solution is H3O plus. The strongest base that can exist in water solution is OH minus. And on Friday, we'll talk about why that is. That's why that works. Okay? Doesn't look like much, but this is about as tough as the problem could come. The equilibrium pH of an HCN solution, of a solution of HCN is 4.98. What is the concentration of HCN? And it's really not that bad a problem if you trust the process, meaning if you trust what I told you about using ice tables. So we start with the balanced equation. The initial concentrations come from the problem, the statement of the problem. So we go to the statement of the problem, and, and it says, what is the concentration of the HCN? Guess what? It's an unknown. We don't know the initial concentration of HCN. 
that's what we're going to have to solve for. These two, it doesn't tell us anything, but nine times out of ten, we're going to ignore those anyway. We don't care about water. The change that occurs comes from the balanced equation. If this reacts, we'll use up some of this and gain some of this and gain some of this. And so at equilibrium, you just add those two together. And now you step back and you say, wait a second, I've got two unknowns, x and z. I like to use z. You can use whatever variable you like. How are we going to solve this? Well, we go back to the problem and it says the equilibrium pH is 4.98. Well, guess what? The equilibrium pH is related to x. So x is just 10 to the minus pH. So we can get that value of x from the problem itself. The reason why this is the hardest way I could ask this question is because half of you, I guarantee it, would have been given this problem and instead of using the table the way that I keep saying to use it, you wouldn't have put x in the table anywhere. You would have just put 10 to the minus pH here. You would have put a number here. And then you'd have said, now where do I go because I don't know what x is. Use the table in the process and believe me, the process will never fail you. The initial concentrations come from the problem. The change row comes from the balanced equation. The equilibrium is always the first row plus the second row. Now you may know something else in addition to that as we do in this problem, but it's always the first row plus the second row. As long as you do that, this problem falls apart because now we can solve for x and we substitute it into our Ka expression. point nine times ten to the minus. And since we know x in this, it just becomes, I'll just rearrange it so that I can get it. Let's see, x squared over four point nine times ten to the minus ten plus x equals I think I did my algebra right. Bring that over, bring that down, add it, yeah. Well, and we know x because we've already said 10 to the minus pH is equal to x. So we know everything here. And what z, z is my initial concentration of HCl. So it ends up, this is actually a trivial problem once you stare at it for a moment. Now, you know I'm going to find another way to complicate it. <laughs> Ka for HCN is right there. That's where it came from. I'd have to give you the Ka for the acid. I, I picked an acid that I already gave you the Ka for. Do I ever not give you what you need? Yes, I will give you the Ka values. I don't expect you to, to memorize Ka values. That's a waste of brain power. Now, I may ask you a question like this, though. Do I want the answer? Sure. What's the answer? 0.224. Amelia tells me the answer here is 0.224. Which, if you think about it, should be reasonable. Why? Because over here we started with a 0.15 molar solution and we got a pH of, I lost it. 5.074 or something like that. We had the discussion of sig figs. I picked a pH over here that was a little bit less than that, so that means you had to have more acid. So the concentration should be greater over there than it was over here, and it is. All right. Here's the other way I can make these tough.
This is the other way to make this a challenging problem. There we go, one for three. I'm warming up for fire night. All right. It's a good omen, isn't it? I better find a basketball one of these days, too. Those are the orange things, right, with stripes? All right. What is the pH of a 0.15 molar sodium cyanide solution? And the Ka for HCN is 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, why did we pick on sodium? Because all group one compounds are soluble. You put this thing into water, what happens? It falls apart into its ions. What are its ions? Sodium ions and cyanide ions. I don't care about sodium ions. All group one compounds are soluble. They're not going to tell me anything. But cyanide ions, I do care about those. If you're in lab and you smell almonds, leave lab, please. Cyanide ions down the drain will react with water to make HCN, which is the stuff they use in the gas chamber. And it smells like almonds. So if you smell almonds in lab, don't stick around. Or find the nearest fire extinguisher and spray it on your partner. <laughs> Those of you in lab this semester will understand that one, right? All right, cyanide plus water. It's an acid-base reaction. In an acid-base reaction, you grab, you either grab a hydrogen from here and put it on here if this is the acid and this is the base, or you grab the hydrogen from here and you put it on here if this is the acid and that's the base. That's what we did up there, right? Which is my acid this time, cyanide or water? Water, it's the only source of this I've got. Oh, it's not such a bad problem. I can write the equi equilibrium expression for it. I can even do my ice table. My initial concentration of cyanide ion is 0.15. How do I know? Because sodium cyanide is a strong electrolyte. It breaks apart into its ions. Water? Who cares? It's just water. HCN, we don't know. OH minus, we don't know. If this reacts, this is what will happen. And so at equilibrium, all right, so far so good. Nothing's changed from everything else we've done so far. Now comes the hard part. I need the value of the equilibrium constant. So my K expression looks like that, based on the balanced chemical equation. Hydroxide ion is a product. So if hydroxide ion is a product, what kind of a K is this? It's a KB. I was given KA in the statement of the problem. I don't have KB. So this is where I have to take advantage of the fact that this is the part of the statement that everybody forgets. For conjugate acid-base pairs, we'll talk about that in a second. Ka times Kb equals Kw. Conjugate acid-base pairs, when you add the acid equilibrium expression to the base equilibrium expression, equals Kw. So for a conjugate acid-base pair, the acid equilibrium reaction plus the base equilibrium reaction I add 
add those two together, I get that. So you only have conjugate acid-base pairs if the acid equilibrium equation plus the base equilibrium equation equals that two water equals H3O plus OH minus. Any other acid-base pair that that's not true for are not conjugate acid-base pairs. So if I were to take HCN and add it to an equation where sodium hydroxide reacts with water, I wouldn't get that H2O giving me H3O plus plus OH minus. Sodium hydroxide is not a conjugate base to HCN. The conjugate base is cyanide ion. The other way to think about it is, okay, if I've got a weak acid, HA, generic weak acids are just given the symbol HA because they're most of them are monoprotic, A minus is the conjugate base. So over here, this acid is the conjugate to that base. This base is the conjugate to that acid. Well, if this is an acid, what's this? A base. And this base is the conjugate to what acid? That one. If this is a base, what is this? An acid. And its conjugate is that base. So water, and we, we mentioned this term on Monday, is amphoteric. It can behave by, like as either an acid or a base. You know another compound that does this. It's one of the things that you put on a fire on the stove, which, wasn't, which is actually written in that safety manual which you all read and signed the document saying you read it. Yes, I'm going to keep ribbing you for that because I thought it was a beautiful question. Anyway. Anybody know what that is? Baking soda. Sodium bicarbonate. If you have an upset stomach, take a little baking soda. If you've got base that somehow spilled on the counter, hopefully you don't, put sodium bicarbonate on it. It acts like both an acid and a base. HCO3 minus, because it's sodium, right? We lose the sodium. HCO3 minus can react with water to make CO32 minus. You've seen bubbles which is the CO2, and water, or it can react to make H2CO3, which is the stuff they put into, this is Coca-Cola's product, right, Dasani? Coke has bicar carbonic acid in it, H2CO3. So HCO3 can form an acid or a base, depending on what it reacts with. We'll talk Friday about which one it will. All right, so if that's the case, we know that our conjugate acid to cyanide ion is HCN, so KB is just KW over KA. KA times KB equals KW. So this is equal to over 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10, which equals <laughs> 2.04 times 10 to the negative fifth. So now if you look back at what we've got, we've got KB. We can fill in this with all of these values. And so it looks like this. At this point, how do you solve it? One of two ways. The first way is use the quadratic equation solver in your calculator. That will never fail you. Or if you don't want to, just assume x is small. And if we do that, then x equals the square root of 0.15 times 
2.04 times 10 to the minus 5, which equals 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3, not 7. And the problem said, what is the pH? The next place where I see people, because of the stress of taking a test where you know you're going to be writing until the end of the hour, is that people will take the negative log of this number and tell me that's the pH. What's the negative log of this number? 2.76. There are two things that you should think about when you do this. First of all, we just solved for x. Go back to your equilibrium table, your ice table. What is x? X is your hydroxide ion concentration, so that's not the pH, it's the pOH. That's one thing. The other thing you should think about is sodium cyanide. Is it an acid or a base? It's a base. If it's a base, should its pH at 25 degrees C be greater than, less than, or equal to 7? Greater than. Is that greater than 7? So that should raise these flags and say, wait a second, I'm dealing with a base. Why the heck do I have a pH less than 7? You don't. You have a pOH. And so that's when you say, how am I going to fix it? Well, the easiest way is pH plus pOH equals 14. It's 25 degrees C. And so the pH equals 11.24. Will you ever learn how to modify the equation for different temperatures. temperatures? Yes, we'll talk about that. Slow down, folks. I still have 120 seconds. Um, why, is the pH? Is the why is it the pOH instead of the pH? What is X? The hydroxide ion concentration. If I take the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration, I get pOH. So that's why it's pOH, not pH. I guarantee at least 10 of you will tell me the pH is 2.76 of a base. And all I'll just say is, huh? Don't do it. Prove me wrong. See you on Friday. I heard that. <laughs>